Welcome to Community City Church, a church where real people like you and me can experience a real God as we do real life together. My name is Edwin, I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad that you decided to join us today for the online sermon message. We do want to let you know that we are having in-person church services, and we would love for you to join us so that you can grow in your faith by getting connected to deeper spiritual community as we learn to walk with Jesus together and change the world with Him. We meet right at the Ferry Way School every single Sunday at 150 Cross Street in Malden, Massachusetts at 10 a.m. Come and experience God with us live and in person. And if you're unable to join us, we are so glad that you're here. We hope that today's sermon will encourage and build your faith as you see that God is moving in your life and in your circumstances. Enjoy the message. Would you please join me for our reading of scripture? Today's reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. Please follow along in your own Bible or with the scriptures on the screen. Again, that is Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on, the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi everyone, my name is Edwin, I'm the pastor of Community City Church, and I'm so glad that you're here as we celebrate Easter in Malden. You know, in case you didn't know, Easter is like the Super Bowl of Christianity, because everything comes down to the historical event of what happened on that day over 2,000 years ago. And it's a pretty big deal that affects every single person in this world, whether they believe in it or not. And today, we're going to look at what happened on that very day. Because the scripture that we read earlier just doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, a person rising from the dead? Can a dead person really live again? And I'm not talking about resuscitation, where someone is declared dead and then brought back to life to live in the same body and then eventually die later on in life. I'm talking about resurrection, because resurrection is very different from resuscitation. Resurrection isn't just living again after you die, but rather it is coming back to life in a new, perfect, and glorified body that never dies again. So can this actually happen to someone? Can a dead person actually be resurrected? And what does this mean for us? Well, in order to say that there was a resurrection, we need to prove that Jesus actually died. On the day of Jesus' crucifixion, which was a Friday, two criminals were crucified with him. Now, usually when criminals were crucified by the Romans, the Romans left them there hanging on the cross overnight knowing that as time passed, the person would eventually die and their body would be devoured by scavengers and insects. However, because the Sabbath was going to begin at sundown on Friday and extend all the way to sundown on Saturday night, the Jewish religious leaders asked the Roman governor Pontius Pilate if Jesus' body could be removed from the cross and buried that Friday night. They wanted Jesus' body removed because according to Jewish law, 
it was illegal to leave the person's dead body up and exposed on the cross overnight. And it was also against the law to work on the Sabbath. So they wanted the process expedited in order to get Jesus buried before sundown on Friday. According to eyewitness accounts of John the disciple, we read, Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So instead of allowing Jesus and the two criminals to continue to suffer and eventually die, the Roman soldiers performed what is known as curifragium, which is the breaking of the lower leg bones as a way to punish the person and expedite their death. This was usually done with a spear or club. So if the Roman soldier saw that the person was still alive on the cross, he would swing the spear at the legs in order to splinter the shins. This would cause such pain that the person would scream in agony. But because they could now no longer push themselves up to breathe, the person would die within a few minutes. And so the Roman soldier did this with the first criminal crucified besides Jesus. And the same thing was done to the other criminal on the other side of Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. At our Good Friday service, we learned that before his crucifixion, Jesus was savagely flogged, meaning whipped and beaten. And medical doctors speculate that he had gone into shock because he had lost so much blood so quickly. This is why not only did Jesus experience exhaustion from the flogging, but also frequently collapsed when he was carrying his cross to the crucifixion point. Retired cardiothoracic surgeon Dr. Anthony DeBono explains the outpouring of the blood and water from Jesus' body and how it explains that Jesus was already dead on the cross and had been for some time. Jesus had a hemothorax, which in the stillness of the dead body on the cross had separated out as they do into two layers the heavier red cells below and the light watery plasma above. The hemothorax was the result of the savage flagellation, uh, meaning flogging. And the withdrawal of the spear would have been followed first by the red cells blood, then by the lighter plasma water. When a hole is made by the spear, the red cells, which John the disciple describes as blood, gushes out first, followed by the plasma, which John saw as water. Jesus was dead, as confirmed by the Roman soldier's thrust of his spear, through the side of his body all the way up to his heart. And we know that this happened, because there were witnesses there watching all of this happening, including some of Jesus' followers and even Jesus' own mother. They saw the nails hammered into his wrist and the stakes hammered through his feet. They saw the crown of thorns piercing his skin. They saw the cross lifted in place as Jesus cried out in agony, asking his own father why he had forsaken him. They heard him have a conversation with the criminals crucified beside him and heard his last words saying, It is finished as he slumped forward. And he died. Since Jesus was officially dead, and since the Jewish leaders wanted his body taken down and buried in order to observe religious law, it was left to Jesus' followers to dispose of his body if they didn't want it left there. One of Jesus' followers, who was a wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea, who kept his belief in Jesus quiet until now, decided to go to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, to ask for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he, meaning Jesus, was already dead. 
Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. Joseph had a fresh cut tomb in a nearby garden, and he wanted to lay Jesus' body there. Usually tombs had many bodies buried together, but in order to honor Jesus, Joseph wanted to dedicate this tomb specifically to Jesus. And so once he received the okay from Pilate, it was then that Joseph and some other of Jesus' followers began the process of preparing Jesus' body for burial. In the first century, this meant wrapping the body in strips of linen that had been mixed with spices and oils in order to prevent decay and mask the smell of decomposing flesh. But because this preparation of the body took a while to do, they realized that they would not be able to finish the job because the sun was setting that Friday evening. And so they would plan to come back early Sunday morning after the Sabbath had ended in order to finish the process. They carried Jesus' body to the tomb and laid it inside. Joseph rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver Jesus said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. See, because the tomb was cut out of rock, on the side of a hill, there was only one entrance in. With a large stone covering the entrance, the tomb was sealed by Pilate's guards by stringing a rope across the stone that was rolled over the entrance. This cord was sealed to the stone with clay in various places along the rope. Knowing what Jesus said about being raised on the third day, the religious leaders took a further precaution by asking that Pilate place Roman guards at the tomb's entrance in order to make sure that nobody could come out and nobody could go into the tomb. So not only was the tomb sealed, but Roman guards were outside guarding it. Now imagine if you were one of Jesus' followers. I wonder what that Saturday was like. For anyone who has suddenly lost a loved one, we all know how traumatic and emotional such a loss is. Maybe the disciples were in denial because all the hope that they had put in this person was now dead. Maybe they were angry because they saw the person that they had followed for the last three years brutally beaten and made a spectacle for all to see. Or maybe they were confused because the one who claimed could do all didn't do anything to save himself that day and all they saw was him getting killed in front of their very eyes. I can imagine thoughts of doubts and skepticism uh, coming to their heads as they were wondering, was Jesus lying all this while? Because if he was lying, then that makes him a hypocrite. Because he told everyone to be honest, whatever the cost. If he lied, claiming that, that all that he was and he, and he couldn't back it up, then that's pure evil because he was deceiving his followers and he was even deceiving the crowds. And if he was lying about everything, then that would make him a fool because his own claims led to his own death. In fact, when he had the chance to speak up and clarify all of it at his trial in front of Pontius Pilate, why didn't he say anything? And don't these same thoughts of doubts and skepticism burden our hearts and minds when God doesn't come through the way that we expect him to come through? When we face situations that make us disillusioned, or when things don't turn out the way that we had hoped, when our dreams are put on hold or even shattered, when our relationships are broken, when people make decisions that affect us 
that we're still trying to recover from. When we think that we should be further along in life than we are at this point, but we're not. We end up questioning God when we experience any sort of pain, suffering, and even loss. Loss of relationships, loss of health, loss of money, loss of opportunities and dreams, loss of time, loss of loved ones. And many times it feels like life doesn't make any sense. There always seems to be something new to worry about. The strife in marriage, uh, conflicts at work, depth to think about, uh, addictions, sicknesses, unhealthy relationships, trauma, and it all seems like it never ends. And even with things happening in our nation and around the world, with wars, hatred, murders, pestilence, injustice, racism, poverty, corruption, we all can agree that the world feels broken, life feels broken, and we feel broken. We feel stuck and chained to our predicaments and circumstances without any solutions of what to do. We find ourselves chained to the shame of our past, chained to the people who have hurt us and the people who we can't seem to forgive, chained to the temptations and addictions that we frequently succumb to, chained to the insecurities that no academic degree or achievement can erase, chained to our fears and our worries of what might happen and what did happen, chained to the condemning thoughts that frequently plague our mind. We try everything but don't know how to get free as we don't know what to do. And we start to wonder, like Jesus' followers in the first century, is there any hope? Where are you, God? Why aren't you doing something about this? Why do I feel so alone in all of this? I thought you loved me. And Jesus' followers cowered in their homes because if Rome massacred their leader and Lord, then surely they will be after his followers too. Because Jesus, the one who claimed to be the promised Savior, the one who promised forgiveness and new life in him, was dead. And the movement was over when a large stone was rolled over his tomb. But God wasn't done. That's why on that Sunday morning we read, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. These women went to the tomb hoping to finish the burial process because they didn't have time to do it before sunset on Friday. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. The stone that morning was not rolled aside so that Jesus could get out but so others could get in and see for themselves that he had indeed risen from the dead, just as he had promised would happen during his ministry on earth. And the young man dressed in a white robe was an angel who moved the large stone and who announced the good news of the resurrection to the women, giving them four messages. The first is, do not be alarmed or do not be afraid. The women were puzzled as to where Jesus' body was because they saw the stone rolled away and thought someone took the body. But the angel said, don't fear, because what has happened is going to bring great celebration and great rejoicing. He also said, he is not here. Jesus is not dead and is not to be looked for among the dead. 
He is alive and has gone ahead of you into the region of Galilee in order to show others that he is alive. Then the angel also said, come and see. The angel invited the women to come into the tomb and to check the evidence to see the place where the body was laid. Here are the women who intended to give Jesus' body a more proper preparation for burial. Realize that all that Jesus said of who he was and what he would do was true. And then the angel said, go quickly and tell. The angel gave them instructions to immediately go and let others know of what had happened. That a resurrection had happened. But when the women went, and told Jesus' closest followers, they were not quick to believe that their Lord had come back to life. But over the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to his followers in both small and large groups. The Apostle Paul, a follower of Jesus, and an actual historical figure writes, For what I received, I passed on to you, as of first importance, that Christ died for all sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Jesus started to show himself alive, and eyewitness accounts testify to seeing him, including his bodily appearance, to more than 500 people at the same time. Jesus even helped people to believe that he was really alive. When the disciples wondered if he was a ghost, Jesus had a meal with them. When Peter felt shame and guilt for denying Jesus three times, Jesus forgave Peter three times. When the disciple Thomas told the other disciples that he would only believe in the resurrection if he put his finger in the nail-pierced holes and see the spear wound, Jesus allowed Thomas to see and feel the scars of his hands and his side. And when Thomas did, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, on Friday, we learned that when Jesus said, it is finished, those three beautiful words meant that his death on a cross created an avenue for us to be forgiven and for our sins and to be made right with God and be made right with others. Jesus had done everything that was needed to be able to be done in order to reconcile us and give us eternal life with him. But those three words mean nothing unless another three words were said, and that is, He has risen. Because only God can conquer death, and for all of Jesus' followers, it meant that everything had changed. The resurrection meant celebration, because despair had given way to hope, death was defeated, and now there was life. Condemnation was now overshadowed by salvation, and freedom was here for all who would believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and is now alive because Jesus came to set us free. Christ's resurrection is crucial to the Christian faith because that means that everything that Jesus claimed to be was true, that he was God in the flesh, Christ's resurrection meant that everything that Jesus said that he would do and would continue to do was true. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then those who believe in him, our faith is worthless and we are just wasted our time talking about all of these, singing about songs about a man who is dead, who had some great teachings. It would all be futile. But if Jesus actually did defeat death, And if he actually did rise from the dead, then it means that he is truly the God who came to us in order to save us from our sins and give us eternal life. Paul continues saying, How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. 
And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all all will be made alive. See, Christianity is not just a faith system or a list of virtues for healthy living. The story of what happened to Jesus is true and historically verifiable. Benjamin C.F. Shaw, writer for the Gospel Coalition, writes in an essay called The Bodily Resurrection of Jesus, said, The claim of Jesus' bodily resurrection is central to the gospel message. Without this bodily resurrection, Jesus' claims to divinity would be empty, and the gospel's claim to be the power of God for salvation would be false. Six facts support the credibility of the historical claim. First, death by crucifixion was not something that the followers of Jesus were likely to invent. Second, Burial accounts fit with the historical evidence that we have. Third, the claim of the empty tomb was easily verifiable, but there are no contradictory accounts. Fourth, the apostles claim to have met the resurrected Jesus face to face. Fifth, these apostles were willing to suffer and die for these claims. Sixth, those who were very unlikely to be converted to this belief were nonetheless converted by means of personal experiences of the resurrected Christ. That is why when people say that Jesus rose from the dead, they in reality are making a historical claim and not a religious one. Believing in the resurrection means believing in God. If God is real and He is the one who created everything, including us, then that also means that He is the God who has the power to resurrect the dead and make things that are broken new and things that are wrong now made right. Because if God doesn't have such power, then Jesus is just a man, just like any other religious figure. But because He has risen, it proves that not only is he God, but he can reverse the curse of sin and death. Jesus conquering death reminds us that he is absolutely sovereign over everything, including all of life and all of death. Which also means that when we believe in him, we can gain a whole new perspective for our lives. Though we may endure pain, loss, grief, trauma, and suffering here on earth, because He has risen on that Easter Sunday over 2,000 years ago, we can know that such pains and trials are temporary and much greater things await us. Because He has risen, our struggles, suffering, and death are now transformed into blessing, joy, and eternal life. Because He has risen, Sin has no more hold on us, and we can experience freedom from the circumstances that we face because Jesus came to set us free. Not only was death defeated on that Easter Sunday, but anyone, anyone, anyone who would believe in Jesus would find freedom from their sins and find new life in Him. That is why we can celebrate like those first century followers of Jesus, because hope is here, because Jesus is alive. So where do you stand with Jesus and such an event? Maybe you feel like it is a nice story. Then we hope that you will come back to hear more stories about this person of hope and how his life impacts yours. Maybe you think that the story is probable. Then investigate more and do it with us as you are free to bring your skepticisms, your doubts, and your questions. Or maybe you think that this is believable. 
then choose to follow Jesus and put your life into his hands today. Wherever you stand, I ask that you give us one more week. Come back as we start with a brand new series called All Things New. Because with the resurrection, God can redeem and God can restore and make things new in our lives and in this world. You don't want to miss what we will be talking about. Remember, Jesus came to set us free and he has risen. Do you believe that this Easter? Let me pray for us. God, your resurrection means that we have hope and that we can experience true freedom only in you. Thank you for dying for us and for doing whatever it took to create an avenue so that we can know you and we can experience your forgiveness. And for those who don't know you, may this be the encouragement that they can get to know you because you love them and you want to forgive them. And for the rest of us who celebrate this momentous day, May we walk away trusting that you are the God. You are the king of our lives so that we don't have to ever worry and ever do life alone. And we thank you for what you have done for us. You know, as we continue in prayer, maybe you're hearing all this and you realize that you don't have a relationship with God and that you want one. You want to experience his love and hope. You want to experience his forgiveness for your sins and his mercy for your sins. And if that is what you want, then on this Easter, I want to invite you right now to ask Jesus to come into your life, to save you from your sins, and to transform you into the person that you were meant to be. If that is your desire today, then will you pray with me right now, saying, Heavenly Father, forgive me for all of my sins. Save me and make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can follow you for the rest of my life. Help transform me into the person that you meant for me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you pray to ask Jesus to come into your life, then that means that you now have a relationship with the God of the universe and that you're part of his family. Please email us at info at communitychurch.org to let us know of your decision. And we would love to get to know you better and even give you some resources to help you to grow in that relationship with God. Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.